our earlier conversation today in, in node testing. Um, so Raul wants to ask Gary as, as far as, you know, uh, apparently Gary has some gaming apps and some scripts or apps that do, it's a, uh, working with words and, and designs and things like that, but it's um, used to, to sort of test, test the system. Uh, they don't really do anything, just generate activity. And Gary was going to figure out what he needed to do in order to get to where, to have it deployed. So um, that was, uh, uh, so we wanted to kind of quiz Gary on as far as where he's at with that and if he needs any assistance. So, um, right. but, yeah. So, yeah, those were those uh, kind of random phrase generators. Hey, Raul. We, I was just updating uh, Ned with our um, discussion earlier today as far as um, with, with Gary and what we were hoping to uh, quiz him on uh, today. Hopefully, he'll, he'll arrive. So here, let me always kind of put together a, an agenda for today to kind of give us a little direction. Hey! Gary, oh, we were we were just mentioning you. Welcome. So I guess now we can we can begin. Um, Gary, we were uh, during node testing earlier today. Uh, we were just so we were discussing apps and uh, uh, scripts and everything that we can do to uh, start testing the hardening the the uh, our node network. So you came up as far as your thoughts and efforts on the the, your, the word apps uh, that and gaming apps that you were uh, discussing. So we wanted to find out uh, what all you have, uh, how how much um, what where you're at in as far as preparing that to connect with our node. Um, what what work there needs to be done and, and if you need any uh, assistance. So just kind of open that up for to, to kind of start the discussion. Yeah, um, I, could, I could use a lot of assistance, um, but honestly, I, I, uh, my health is not good right now. I had an episode mm -hmm. yesterday and I, I had to take two beta blockers for it. And that nearly um, did me in, I think. Sure. But anyway, I did a stress test today and it, it looked real good. Okay. But I'm spending a whole lot of time on my health. So sure. I'm sorry to, to let you down, but I could, you know, I think we could use a lot of help with, uh, with robot and the Discord bot, and uh, uh, I could use help, you know, setting up my not my node. <laughs> I'm I'm really behind, guys. But uh, uh, it's, I see I got to get in so deep, and my my bandwidth is is um, not sure. too, not too high. Uh, mental bad with here because I these areas I, I have to move into them so slowly but uh, you know I was thinking all, along the lines of just setting up some uh, some uh, robot apps that you know spew out uh, you know poems or, or uh, word puzzles or even little graphic patterns, um, ASCII patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anything we can code into a grammar. Uh, I've got show, a lot of can ideas. I, can you show us? Can you show us a grammar you've been working on? Yeah. I've been assuming that we could just put put in rolling grammar, the same way you put in your other grammars in order to uh, encode snippets, whatever, in order to, you know, instead of generate poetry, generate Roland programs, no? Yeah, you could, I think you could do that. Okay, let me show you right quick. Yep.
Okay. It's uh so so here is my my grammar. Um it's in a it's in a it's a Java uh JavaScript program running on glitch. And here's the code for it. And so here's the grammar file. And what the grammar file does is it, um, here at the origin, I can print out strings with the program. And the strings are made up of, uh, of uh, now I suppose you would call these names, but so I'm telling my program to output this string that consists of uh, uh, let me go to one that's a little bit simpler. And, uh, the, these hashes are uh, something like patterns inside yeah uh that that is a left side of a grammar mm. you know what i mean it's uh, yeah yeah it's like a variable right that's right so if i go down and look at uh oh where's one it's easy to find um for instance here are, here are adverbs the program uses adverbs uh all over the place so if this uh, hashtag adverbs ever shows up, it's free to substitute, you know, any adverb uh -huh. there in my list. Uh, whenever I put in, you know, literal numbers, uh, I get I get expressions made up of of uh, patterns of of four syllables and five syllables or any combination of that gives me nine so that I can produce, uh, you know, uh, expressions in my poetry and stuff. Uh, uh, this, this is number of letters or? Syllables. Uh, oh, okay. Like this, this is, these are the six syllable strings. So generative grammar has six syllables, I hope. And grammar generator has six syllables and category theory has six syllables and distributive AI and and Kleisley categories and all those things have six syllables. So if my poem ever requires something that has six syllables, uh, it's free to use nice. any of the anything in there. All right. So let, let me go to uh, this is a, this is a this is not really a good example of the program. I'm using a program called Tracery. Hey Gary, uh, did you hand code all those grammars? Yeah, or you did. Yeah, I did. That's pretty. Well, cool. so, some of the JSON files of of uh, adverbs and things already existed. I just pulled them off of GitHub. Okay. But but the poems and things I came up with. I mean, they're they're, they're standard exercises and. Right. Have you have you had any? Uh, Sorry, let me turn. I, I'm trying to eat some lunch here. Sorry. Have Have you uh, had any? Have you attempted at all to uh, make this native rolling? I'm not quite sure what that would mean, but I've considered doing what Jim's talking about. And and see, these are simpler examples of of left side and right side. Uh, so. Uh, well, this is some of these are production rules, and some are I don't like that one. But anyway, we could we could cause that one to produce uh, grammar, and uh, I can't see my screen. You know, it'll, it'll pull up the random things like down here. Whatever it sees, path in the in the grammar, it'll substitute one of these things, and so we just re-roll it. 
And I like this it. one. Hold on. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not sure if we can get back to it, but uh, <laughs> I might go to the video and, and find the number. But <laughs> anyway, though, you can get one or you can get, you know, it, it'll spew them out if you want. Right. You know, these are cool. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. It's called yeah. 23. It's it's a it's a artistic uh, writing tool, creative yeah, writing tool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, but yeah kind of I've, I've considered doing what Jim's talking about and coming over here and um, uh, coming up with uh, primitives as uh, I don't know if we need to talk about primitives, but I think Jim was thinking about generating Roland code. I'm thinking about a ro a generating executable Roland code. Right. Well, I don't know. Maybe Jim can answer that. But but what I'm thinking of is let's push all this into a dot row. You know, let's make this you know a smart contract. Right. Let's make let's build this in native Roland. So you'd have to you know put your grammars inside of your uh, you know, uh, you know, oh, smart I, contract, your row no, file. I, I think I see what you're talking about now, and I'll be honest, I never thought about that. That That is an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, let's just do this all in native Roland. Uh, Ned, you, you mean uh, like complete implementation? Or... It, yeah. It, it kind of what level are you seeing making the, the jump to Let's do the whole thing. So let's put your grammar, which is basically uh, data sets. So let's put that all into a smart contract, I, I guess, right? And then let all the algorithms that uh, randomly pick from that grammar, uh, you know, let's write that in Rolang and, and, and make it a 100% pure Rolang application. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, and you've got, you, you've got a, a bunch of code that, you know, is meaningless, but you've got a bunch of it and it's written in Rolang and now you can, uh, 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 what do you call it? Fuzzer this thing. With, with some code we could actually get back to and, and play with because we played with it before. Okay. Do we want this code to reside on the community uh, repository in GitHub where we would like to see it? I don't see why not. I mean, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, I let's, let's uh, look at the objectives. I think basically what Ned is suggesting is basically make a Rolang app out of this as kind of some kind of a fun uh, little Rolang application that people can look at and play, and then it generates these random poetry, so to speak. I think that's one part of it. Um, the other thing we were looking at is, which was where Jim was um, talking about earlier, is to generate fragments of Rolang programs that we could use to test the uh, current code base in an automated fashion. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, you could come up with uh, test suites for different uh, packages and and uh, customize them and, and add to them. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a, really a good idea. Uh, yeah, so my idea is that if I'm, an, if I'm a DAP developer, there's always going to be data, and there's always going to be selecting the data, and then there's going to be acting on the data. And so if we did something like this, it would you know, be a great tutorial, you know, how do you store your data? I think yeah. so too. Get, start getting rolling patterns in these, in these kinds of, of easily manipulable uh, uh, two editors. Exactly. So like, like actually one interesting thing would be if in this poetry we generate Roland, Roland uh, tidbits of advice, to say never do this, do this, that sort of stuff. Oh, and poetry being generated would be even even more uh, interesting. I don't know how complicated it would be, but something to think about. So, so the cool thing about that is it's all in the grammar, right? So there's the grammar, 
and then there's the scaffolding, which pulls from the grammar. So you're basically, you have to get your procedural rules right, and then you have to get your grammar. And the grammar would just keep growing and growing and growing. It'd yeah. become like, a, a, you know, the, the latest incarnation. I don't know if you guys remember, like Joshi's cheat sheet, which had like the rules and stuff. Yeah. And yeah, we could build that out in here. You could kind of have a dynamic rule sheet that, but you know, could it be always changing to update your know, latest uh, best practices? Yep. It sounds good to me. I, I, uh, I, you know, my, my eyes are always, you know, bigger than, than I can actually pull off. But, you know, just, just realizing that, that you can, you can envision these things as well is, is, is quite reassuring. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I do like the artistic poetry thing, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I think we basically uh, thought of three different versions of this, right? One version is the art, the poetry, which does just what this thing does right now, except in Rolang. Second one is a Rolang advisor or Rolang, uh, I don't want to call it a tutor, but basically some kind of a Rolang uh, tutor. Yeah, and the third, between the third one is a rolling tester that actually generates uh, random rolling code that can uh, that can be run against existing code base. Sure, these are great ideas. I love all of them. Uh, what we're probably going to end up doing is ending up, you know, sort of porting this tracery open source project to to rolling, and you know, of course, we'll. We'll give uh, Galaxy Kate credit for it because she's the inventor of it. Uh, Kate Compton. She I added her name to the potential board members list, but she's she's a new PhD in computer science. Okay. But, but so is she, is she interested? Because we're certainly looking for board members also. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh she doesn't respond to me. I don't know. I, my my uh, poems may scare her. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> You're too That's much true. of a romantic, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> your, your poems, which are derived from her code. <laughs> I'm saying that again. Well, I said your poems that are derived from her code. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I early on, I didn't know you weren't supposed to. Uh, ping people with your bots, uh, and that uh, Twitter shut me down. Uh, but uh, I, I now understand why that's a bad thing to do for bots to be allowed to do things that uh, because they, if they're allowed to do those things, they will immediately become nuisances. So, I guess the question is to move down um, this set of one of. Uh, three paths or all three that we enumerated earlier. What, what do you need? And I guess I'm also wondering what is the easiest and most productive uh, piece to do? Oh, For example, converting oh. this into a rolling system, is that like very complicated is one question I have. Yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, we could tie it into Rolang pretty easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm not sure, uh, but but again, I'm not sure exactly when Ned says doing this in Rolang. I'm not sure, you know, where we're actually do you know technically doing it. Uh, well, I, I think we want a lot of you know these these use cases that you mentioned. All three of them are are quite doable in this. Uh, I, I think, you know, just diving uh, headfirst into, you know, writing this, this whole thing in Rolang would be pretty, pretty tough unless we already had it sort of running as it stands right now. Uh, and, and yet, but, but yet doing it in uh, doing some part of it in rolling programs, if that makes any sense. If somebody's got a better idea than, than that, uh, then let me know. But that would be, that would be what 
and in so doing, try to get examples of all three of those things that you talked about in a useful uh, dog fooding fashion, and then move towards you know you know completely having a a rolling port of uh, of tracery or something like that. Does that? Does anyone agree or? Right. Agree? I, I was on mute. I, I don't. I don't think we need to recreate tracery. I think we. Uh, are you? Are you? Don't think we need to port tracery? No, no. I think we need to write this in native rolling. I remember, you know, rolling is supposed to be a general purpose programming language uh, for the next wave of compute, right? So we. So you could have data. And then you could have procedures to pull the data out and then display it somehow. Okay, Ned, I, I think I see what you're talking about now, but we might have to have more conversations about that. But chances are I'm just gonna have to think about it. Yeah, but, so like I don't I don't know is the best way to take the grammar and put all the grammar in a in a single smart contract with a uh, that can be queried directly, or does this all exist in one smart contract? Well, we can do that uh, in, in fairly short order. You, you know, you could have a smart contract that contains the entire grammar and has like, you know, a, a getter. I guess you could even do a setter, but has some kind of get method. You send, send in some kind of parameters. And right. Okay. And okay. I see what you're, I see what you're saying now. Just go. Okay. I, I'm, I'm starting to, I'm starting to get it. Go ahead. So, so I don't know, I, uh, you know, do you have like uh, unforgeable names for like the adverbs and for the different pieces of the grammar? Uh, and then people, you know, and then you expose that through your smart contract and then anybody could call that smart contract and get returned to them one of these really cool uh, sentences. And, okay. then, and then once you have that scaffolding in place to have it become like this Rolang tutorial, you would change basically i think you end up changing only the grammar so ned uh you, you said storing this grammar is uh is one piece of data do you do you mean to to have it structured like some kind of syntax tree not, not as a string right uh, that's for you guys who are much smarter at programming uh, than me to decide <laughs> how it's actually going to be uh, stored. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're going to want some kind of way to represent the data. Like in the old days, if I was using SQL Server, right, I'd put all this grammar into a series of related tables. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and something like that. This is somehow, uh, um, in a sense, similar to, to uh, making a types, right? You, you, uh, making a what? Structure. Types. Type. Uh, oh, types. yeah, 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 exactly. Be because uh, you are creating a structure. You are creating some, some, some kind of hierarchy uh, of, 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 this, uh, of this grammar, right? So, so this is the, the work of, of, of Parser, to take one, one sequence of bytes and convert it in some kind of tree structure that is like types. So uh, the, 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 this part is difficult to, to write now in, in Roland. It, it would be great that we can write parsers in, in Roland, but uh, we don't have all the, all the nice operations to, to do it. So maybe, maybe we can think about uh, what can we do now in Roland and how this is related to, to applications, something like that. Yeah, I wasn't thinking so much about types, uh, um, but more data structures. Uh, so let's see, I'm looking, Gary, where you have, uh, okay, so if we look at what you have on the left here, you have origin, you have line, you have nearby, you have substance, you have mood. Uh, I'm assuming those are like uh, the key to a set of data. So mood, you have, about like 10 or so words exactly from here to here these are all uh possible substitutions for mood in uh up here where you see a hashtag 
uh, there is a there is one. So we'll we'll get one of these things to produce an origin. Uh, it will substitute one of these things in the mood right there. Gotcha. And this this is uh, this right here. If I didn't have this, it, this wouldn't be so confusing. But this is I'm sorry. Up until the colon is special tracery uh, syntax for uh, uh, for uh, for one of these things, one of these substitutions you want to hold throughout the whole story. And that's that's kind of uh, that's just. Uh, this, is, this is like a side effect. <laughs> the last, last contract in, in Rome. This is something that you you have uh, from from the context, right? It's not uh, generated by the language. So and and, and these uh, these keys are like uh, constructors for, uh, for 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 a language for a term in this language, right? And yes. this is like a, this left left hand side of the graph. This is like a send or receive uh, in in the in the rolling language. Yes, I, I've ha I've had that uh, intuition myself several times. And then, uh, what is the difference? Uh, the the uh, these keys in in this grammar are just strings, right? They they don't have any structure. And and uh, this is uh, uh, why. They don't have uh, reflection. When you have reflection, these keys become also structured, right? Mm. Okay. Th this is the point where the reflection gives something, right? I I'm impressed that you can make that observation from looking at this. Well, this is just, <coughs> just a, right? <laughs> it's just a map with uh, with constructors. So, from from that perspective, it's very easy, right? Yeah. Just okay. These are constructors in my language, and uh, this is how it works, right? I, I will pick one of these. This is like array of all the possibilities, right? Usually, the grammars are uh, as Greg, Greg was explaining. Gram grammars are like generators for the language. Yes, and and and, and these constructors are final, like uh, they are not in, uh, infinite. With a more complicated grammar. Uh, this this uh, constructor can be infinite, and we just choose one. Of them. So, so th yeah. this this can be also infinite. What what Ned uh, you, you suggested? So so contract accept new new uh, 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 new new words. Right. This is like grammar, which, which is not finite. Fine, fine. So uh, I had a question about the left window and the sentences that are coming over here. So the left in the left window, it says line. It starts with the mood capitalized and mood, the, and then the place and the mood, etc. But the sentences yes. on the right hand side don't seem to uh, match that uh, line structure. Is it randomized? I mean, is it just a matter of picking no. some pieces of it, or so, one of the options in the line is what is coming? Or yeah, I guess it. It's picking a second format because in line, well, actually there are. Could go back to origin, right? Origin, I think, is the basic high level framework. That's right. And line comes in after my place and path. Yeah, line is here, and so you get the your story is is down and within this this expression right there. So, but where is the definition of my place on the left? My place on the left. My place is is what, what what we're saying is my place is going to be path. So when you see uh, what it says right here is is use. It's really telling it to use one occurrence of or, or um, if path occurs twice in the story. Right. It's telling it to use the pad that that belongs to the my place structure. Well, yeah, it's telling you to use the one that you've got right here. Right, it's right. Like a variable, right? You're you're using the same variable on two places, right? Is yes, it? you're you're using the same substitution in in uh, mm -hmm. because if if you don't use the same substitution. Uh, the place could change within the story, and then and it would make less sense than it does now. 
Mm. Okay, so let, let me understand. In line, I see uh, three different options listed. One starting with mood capitalize. Second one starting with nearby capitalize. And the third one starting with filling me with, um, yeah. I'm assuming, based on the commas. Um, is this, in this case, what we're seeing here is it's picking the second option, which is nearby capitalize, and then my place moved, uh, et cetera. Is that what's going on? I mean, I'm just trying to relate. Uh, okay, let me, let me just walk through the sentence. It's saying, do a substitution now for path mm -hmm. and, and, and keep it in my place. So this, I, this will be the only substitution into my place that will occur. Okay. Or wait a minute, let me think about it. This will be the only substitution in the path that will happen during uh, uh, during this this thing, and this can be thought of as a production, I guess. Okay, so we come down here and we we do a mood, and that capitalized. You know what that means. So we substitute with a mood, and we we substitute with another mood. It can be any other mood. And then we substitute, we, we take what we, we found up here for my place. And we don't do another substitution there. Uh, we, we substitute again for mood. We uh, substitute for substance. We substitute for nearby. We use the same my place, but this time we put an article in front of it. We do uh, a move with the uh, past tense on it through the substitution on a path. Okay, but this will be a new substitution on the path. Mm. Uh, through, through, see, we're taking a different, I mean, this is a path within the my place path. Okay. Uh, filling me with substance okay any questions or i think i uh, see if everything you, if, if you uh, when you when you have multiple uh productions inside the the other production do, do you have do, do you get uh, uh always must be different or you know can or, or can be the same is it uh, guaranteed that they are different or well, see, each time we do a substitution in this production rule, it can pull anything. It's indeterminate. It, it can pull anything out of the list. And so we have to do a special substitution up at the top. I suppose that's what that is. And we substitute. Yeah, my, my question is, uh, if, if you use the path on, on, on two places, are there, can, can they be the same? Can they choose the, the, the same in both cases? I I don't know how you would do that. You know, in a in a substitution, uh, in a parsing. Oh, I, I'm just thinking about, for example, this uh, substance. Uh, is yeah. it going to be uh, different, or it can choose two two substances that are the same in the same in the same line? Well, I, I guess what it means is you've, oh, wait a minute. I, I, they call this, this colon here a stack, a push stack. And a, well, no, no, this is not a stack, but it's, it's similar to a stack. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, when you create a variable, you create something on stack. So, uh, so yeah. you know, we can, okay. uh, if we're writing this, we can do whatever we want, right? Yeah. So we can have some way to say, uh, every time you say path, use the first one that was randomly selected and just always use that for path. And then, or we could say just every time it's totally uh, random. And uh, as we were talking about this, in, in some ways it's like regex on steroids, right? So what I'm suggesting is uh, this is like a semantic part, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the grammar doesn't tell us which word or, or what, what is the logic of choosing the word. Yeah, so. but, but uh, Thomas, if you look at the last sentence, 
it says beyond the brook, a brook twirled through the f fence. Oh, so I, I don't I, know if that answers your question. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I think that was random, yeah. right? I think the fact that it did brook twice in there is just random. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so there's no guarantee to, to be different. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, what we could do is, you know, I, I would say let's just start out simple and make everything, you know, somewhat random. And then once we have that working, you know, and then we can build this transformational grammar on top of this and just keep adding and adding and adding rules. <laughs> Sounds we, great. We can, we, can, we can exactly use uh, what Greg was uh, uh, explaining. The grammar and the structural equivalence, like uh, uh, how to, uh, uh, this grammar is generated and what is the equality, and then uh, 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 how is uh, reduction rules. Right. So and I, was, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think at some point, you know, once we get something working, you know, we should show it to Greg because I'm sure he could then start, you know, building a lot of his math, you know, mathematical models, you know, into something like this. I think that'd be really cool. Cool. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I'm still wondering in terms of the, the generating the Roland code from this is how easy or complicated is it what do you guys think i think that's going to be really difficult i think i mean this is great because like when you see like the first sentence far away a stone wall spiraled through the brook filling me with light you know i'm not sure a writer would ever i think it's really cool i'm not sure a writer would actually ever sit down and write that sentence uh, even though maybe grammatical. No, no. So correct. Let me let me qualify my oh, statement. So, so I think to like try to spit out rolling code that's meaningful. No, no, not that's <laughs> meaningful. I'm just saying it could be random, um, but but it is uh, maybe. I mean, it may not even be reasonably formed, so to speak. But something um, that could be random that we could then put test against the code to see if the code is catching and behaving. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I understand. I, I think in that case, we're going to have to not go this deep into the abstraction layer, because I think you're going to need to actually have well-defined rolling code and then just randomly pick, you know, those snippets. So, you'll, you, so your grammar, I think, will be a, a grammar of snippets that are proven rolling code. Uh, and then maybe this pulls them out in different ways, but each uh, each snippet we know is going to be able to work, right? So, so maybe a snippet is going to be like a for loop, and then another snippet is going to be waiting for on a channel for a variable, and then another snippet will be, you know, something else, and another snippet will be something else, and then we know that those pieces together individually all work, and then it's really this is just amassing them in some you know, kind of higher, you know, some code that is built on top of these. Right. I mean, Josh's cheat sheet, for example, would that be the start of what we need to feed this as the components or something along those lines? And then... I, I don't know. I don't know if that would create a meaningful program, though. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I mean, basically, his cheat sheet enumerates the different structures available to in Rolang, right? Different things available in Rolang. It did. I don't know how accurate it still is, but it, it did. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, I, I don't see that. I, having worked a lot with algorithmic composition, it's difficult to uh, well, build. There is a part, there is a part of, uh, uh, of uh, exactly something similar as this capitalize. Uh, this is something that is part of the rolling uh, which, which we can uh, encode in, in uh, this uh, uh, code that we generate and we can call these methods in any random order. Right? And we can maybe check some, some, uh, some uh, unexpected result, maybe some error that we don't expect. Or, I mean, uh, 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 operations like uh, uh, 
create a new new list or map or set or mm. this kind of stuff. So, I've got a question. Would the would the race conditions in a concurrent uh, program allow create enough randomness for the words to ap appear as random? So, you, so the, the the sentences are are generated uh, with a concurrent process, and a concurrency is it may be Stonewall uh, at, at one one generation, it could be Forest at in a, another time. So when you have concurrency, there's a race condition, so th things appear one time and appear another time. Would that create enough? Uh, of, of a shuffle of the words? Each oh, theory, theory every theory. time you run a smart contract, it's going to exist on its own, right? And hopefully we don't have race conditions. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say is it, okay. we won't have any race conditions. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so one thing is sometimes testing is going to be difficult. I was just thinking about the capitalized example that when you look at the output, you're going to have to look at the generated code and see that it was actually calling some capitalized method to test to see whether that worked or not. Yeah. Unless you get this to be smart enough, that not only does it generate rolling code, it generates the test of <laughs> rolling code that it just produced. That, that would be interesting. Now that would be a good utility, self-generating unit tests. <laughs> well, I think you can do all kinds of things with this. At least I know I can do all kinds of things with this, which, you know, I don't know how I would do in, in any other language because I just don't have time to learn anything else. But mm. playing with these grammars, see, you know, being able to, I mean, it's really insightful to me to be able to have something to think about. You know, when I hear Greg talking about all these uh, uh, proof or, or uh, you know, our theory is our our types and our proofs are the program. Mm -hmm. And what is the, what are the production rules? The production rules in in that sense, th th this is the program, and the execution of this program is like a proof. Is a proof. So these sentences are proof of, of this program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but no, I, I think I think uh, there's all kinds of th things we can do here. It tends to, you know, I, I tend to get lost in the in the forest, and uh, there's so many possibilities here. But I guess that's that's going to be always the the problem, but yeah, which direction should we go first? Oh, well, I would say whatever takes the least effort and gives the most value, right? <laughs> so um, that's that's what I would ask of you of of the whole group <clears throat> to say what what is easiest to do and and gives us quite a bit of value. Well, I, I don't know that we need to come up with an action action item today, but uh, at least we're all uh, talking about the same subject. Um, do, do any of you think you will take a look at this this tracery IO editor? There are a lot of see there are just there are default uh, grammars you can pull up to get different stories. To why won't this do anything? Really? It says at the top they also generate graphics. 
Oh yeah, and I my uh, I've had mine generating graphics before. Uh, I I was actually copying somebody else's graphics, so I finally started feeling guilty about that. Even though his was open source, I I, I felt bad about you know using his creation, so I turned my graphics off. But uh, let's see. Uh, I'm having trouble with the screen. But anyway, it's open source and anybody could go there. Uh, maybe we can relate this to uh, to work that uh, Isaac is doing for, for Oli in Cape Verde. Because <laughs> in, in a sense, it's similar. He's also specifying uh, grammar for a language, right? And then uh, he's specifying the rules of uh, semantic rules. And these semantic rules are really this right hand side, <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe we can relate somehow this. So you think uh, you think if if uh, Isaac. Um, and you can play with this tool. We may be able to create rolling uh, programs of some sort. Or is it trying to build a whole new tool that is similar to Traceway? So uh, converting this to, to, to rolling, uh, the, the, the first part is uh, uh, storing the, just the data, right? Because we, we are not able to, 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 to make some, any graphics or anything. So uh, in that sense, uh, rewriting this in Rolling would be much more uh, yeah. JavaScript involved than, than Rolling. Exactly. Yeah, no, no, I'm not talking about writing this in Rolling. I'm talking about using this to generate Rolling snippets just like <clears throat> Gary is uh, generating poetry. I think that's the most difficult of any of these paths. Sorry, Ned, what did you say? That's the? I, I think that's the most difficult. That's going to be the most difficult of any path. So the first problem with, with these kind of uh, uh, programs are usually they are just online. And they don't have any API. So writing anything serious uh, uh, is, is very difficult because you, you have only this uh, UI to enter this uh, grammar, which is not something that you usually do when you, when you program things. You, you have a uh, uh, source control, you have everything you know, that you can. Well, I, 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 love, uh, along those lines, I, I, can, uh, I can run my tracery grammar in a, uh, a node bash shell. Mm. Why so, would you want to do that, though? Maybe they well, have some kind of API. Yeah. Um, no, but yeah. why do we even want to, to, to me, so the way I would approach this is create your data sets, your grammar, and then figure out how you're going to call into that grammar. That's what I was saying before. You'd have a, a getter that would pull out some random something from your grammar. And then you could parameterize that and build on that. That way you have some data and you have a way to pull out the data. And just start with that. And no, no you know, I'm not thinking any UI or anything at this point like this. Just here, you know, here's here's data and here's a way to pull some data out. Then you build, once you had that, right, you could pull out anything, right? Now you start tagging things with a, some kind of category. I guess they're using like adverb or place or whatever. And, and then you have a way to tag your data and then have your getter now become a little more sophisticated and now look through your data and randomly pull out something that matches that tag. Right, then now you're getting some kind of data coming back. And then the, the host piece, which is doing the getting of the data, now starts to build some logic 
to piece the data it's getting in some kind of uh, logical way. And then now it's calling in, getting the data, piecing it together in some kind of logical way, and then outputting it you know, to the command line. And once you have that, then you can start building out your grammar. You can start building out the rules for pulling the data out of the grammar. And you can build out the rules for piecing that data together in unique and interesting ways. And you could just build it kind of piece by piece that way. Yeah, you, you, you're really talking about uh, uh, like implementation of this kind of program, right? Yeah, but not with the UI kind of stuff. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Just like a, a, a bash uh, 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 joke of the day or something. You know, you send joke 13, uh, you run joke 13 and get a random joke. Sure. I, I'm always thinking like MVC is my paradigm, you know, model view controller. Oh, if you guys know, sorry. It's, it's just a standard uh, software pattern, right? You have your model, which is your data. Uh, you have your view, which is the output. And then you have your controller, which is like the middle piece, which manages and navigates uh, between the, the, view, uh, the view and the model. I'll look it up. Yeah, that, that's interesting because it definitely, you know, finding a, a, a model uh, discussion framework is, is quite difficult. Yeah, MVC. I mean, this is also like a big step to uh, use something like that and, and, and then uh, <laughs> implement it. Yeah, but, and the cool, but the cool thing is, right, then uh, we're really taxing our knowledge of Roland, right? And this is the great thing. Like, each piece becomes, like, a separate uh, tutorial on, on, on how to do this with Roland. And, uh, yeah, I just, I, I just found the link. I haven't looked at it too closely, but this is kind of um, on the MDC pattern. And... Uh, and they have all kinds of variations. Uh, years ago, I, I, I was a member of MS, uh, MSDN, the Microsoft Developer Network. And I had a, I don't even know, it was a DVD, that's how long ago it was. It was probably a CD of, you know, the top 50 design patterns, you know, from Microsoft. And really the one that MVC is like totally the one that has uh, kind of withstood the test of time and, and most, enterprise applications I've been involved with over the last the last year yes, and, and, and this is this is usually when you have a, a like server which uh, uh, have this pattern but if, if you if you go in the in more client applications then you, you this pattern that doesn't work uh, you know it doesn't work if you're going to use like the uh, you know like the C sharp impl implementation of MVC but from a conceptual, because you always have data, whether the data is in, you know, like some enterprise store like SQL Server or the tuple space, you know, it's still data and you still need to retrieve the data and add the data, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It, it is more about this, uh, this cycle. Right? There, there is an event and there is a view, right? It's, it's not mixed together. This view is like very, it's, 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 uh, uh, one direction, not by direction. This is like more that is interesting in, the, in this model. Uh, mm, so, yeah, so here's where the nomenclature gets a little interesting because, you know, inside of Visual Studio, if you're creating an MVC project, it has more of a fixed meaning like you just said. Right, you know, the way they implement it is, you know, you have your you know, whatever. Uh, I think of it more just as a conceptual, you know, without any scaffolding already in place. Mm. Yeah. Right. So your view is going to be your view. And then the controller is responsible for however that view needs to be implemented. 
for you know each unique use case. So the way I think of it, you know, I guess this was you know, uh, the way to develop applications for many years. It's amazing that so many people today haven't heard of it. But uh, <clears throat> is that the model? It's a separation of concerns. The model right. is how your objects behave independently of how you control them or how you look at them. This is, you know, if it's a bank, these are the, you know, the bank balances. These are the, you know, the nuts and bolts of what happened, you know, of what, uh, of what objects the system is composed of, uh, and what can be done with, you know, how they, how they uh, can be acted on, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the controller is is, um, uh, uh, is sort of like, you know, your buttons how you, the things you can do. And the view is how that causes it to be displayed uh, based on, you know, what you, you know, how, how uh, uh, so that uh, uh, you could have a model and then you could have a bunch of different interfaces for that model uh, <clears throat> um, because you separated your concerns. Yeah. This is how we look at it. This is how we control it. This is how it works internally by itself. Yeah, the separation is important because it gives you uh, pieces that are fully decoupled. But then usually these frameworks are uh, gives you uh, uh, force you that uh, you uh, write all of your logic with uh, in, in this style, right? And and. Uh, I, I see a, a lot of these services that uh, uh, are built directly on the on, on, on the controllers. Right? You, you use uh, web API controller in, in your project, and all 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 of your API is written with uh, with web API, and this is like a good thing. But this is also the problem because you could you could write your your service just as a, a basic language concept, right? Like just uh, as an interface. Then you can plug it. With whatever you want, and and this is something not uh, that is encouraged with this kind of thing. No, I don't. I, I don't agree uh, because I think what you just said totally fits into the paradigm of MVC. Remember what I said. Not I'm not talking about MVC as a specific implementation. I'm talking about MVC from a conceptual. So I think what you just said is yeah. Sometimes you'll build some Rust APIs as, as your interface. But that doesn't mean you couldn't do it in a different way, and you still end up with your controller, which is the middleware, and then you still end up with your data. And you, I remember, there's also MVVC, or M yeah, yeah. MVCC, right? You could just <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's different versions, yeah. Uh, uh. MVVM, uh, M yeah, all, all kinds of stuff, but. Uh, so I think like the tuple space is the model, right? Inside of Rolang, right? That, that that's where the data is stored, right? Inside the tuple space. Yeah. Because you deploy your contract, right? When you deploy, so if your contract just had, like, let's just say your contract only had grammar, then when you deploy that contract, that grammar now gets added to the tuple space, right? Yeah. Inside this this contract, you know, or in, in 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 some in some form, in, in some structure, right? Right, right. So then, at the end, we are, we 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 have this uh, structure that uh, that we are manipulating. So we, we want to be to, uh, as close as possible to to know what what is what without some kind of additional logic, right? Which which is not really necessary. For, for example, uh, uh, we don't really care about the gRPC protocol when we communicate with Arnold. We just want to know what is the signature. And the protocol layer should be completely opaque, right? We, we don't care about it. So, yeah. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I have to unpack that a little bit, but I think you're right. <laughs> uh, I, I can, I can, I, I will, I will show you what, what exactly I mean uh, with uh, uh, 
uh, with uh, this communication that I'm now working on for with the gRPC. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will take uh, I will take uh, uh, JSON definition of uh, all the pro protobuf files, uh, and I will not write uh, these methods by hand. I will just take the structure and interpret the structure. So when we have this grammar, we we, uh, we just need to think about how to interpret this like a static structure. And this is how uh, what, what is our language are uh, uh, is doing, right? It's transforming one structure to the other. This is like a reduction that we are doing in this language. So I will do the same thing. I will, I will take the, the JSON of the of the specification and just generate uh, whatever it is in this in, in, in this uh, uh, protobuf definition. So when uh, when uh, I know this uh, when, when they change the, the types. Uh, this code will still work because it does not depend on some specific uh, thing inside the specification. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Well, it's a good session, um, but I need to go. Yeah, Gary, go take care of yourself. Yeah, take care. Bye -bye. See you, Gary. So the other so, thing, right after after all is said and done, what I'm curious to find out. Say we have we deploy this grammar, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> right, you know, how much is it going to cost in gas? To, uh, you know, even if we took something, you, you know, uh, small like Gary, what Gary's built already. If we try to store that in the tuple space, what's it going to cost? And then what's it going to cost to make use of it? Right, so somebody's going to deploy the contract that puts it in the tuple space. That's going to have to get paid for. And then my smart contract that's now knows about it and is going to be able to use that data you know, what's it going to cost me to generate one of these little poetic, you know, phrases? Yeah, it's worthwhile an experiment. It's a worthwhile experiment. Um, I, I'm trying to think, so what, what are our next steps here? <clears throat> what are we going to do? Who is going to do them? Well, is this something the collab wants to uh, take a shot at? I will definitely make something similar with uh, with this work on, on Vault. So, <laughs> because I, I see this pattern in many places with, with communications, it's it's very similar. Mm. So, I, so, how how can we synergize the efforts that are going? Like, if Isaac is working on something, and there's something here that we want to do, how can we quickly? Um, build bridges uh, so that we can generate something relatively quickly. Any ideas? I, I don't know what Isaac is working on. I thought he was a real math guy. He's working on a K framework. So a K framework, um, well, you, you you put in your code and it helps to find matches and you know if there's uh, something that is unmatched it'll pop it out for you to be able to see it's kind of, and it's also good at finding bugs is it a parse again I'm just looking it up now so he, he's writing a, a rolling specification of, of the whole language He's writing rolling specification in where? In what? In the K framework. Oh, I see. So and, and yeah, there, there is similarity with uh, this kind of uh, thing. Like this is very 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 simple, and uh, but they are they are similar in a sense that uh, he he writes a rolling specification of of, of the syntax and uh, semantics, and uh, when you when you specify some some rolling term. Uh, you can uh, you can have many different outcomes, right? And, and this is similar how how these uh, sentences are generated. 
for, for one grammar specification, you can generate different uh, sentences. So in, in, that, in that sense, uh, this is how programming language works. So I guess the question is, uh, how far down is he, um, or how complete is his uh, specification of the Rolang in K framework? And secondly, can that help generate the testing fragments we want to use against our code base? I was talking to Isaac how to generate uh, visualization, which is also, <laughs> in a sense, similar. Yeah, yeah. we are we are uh, slowly progressing in, in all of these things. <laughs> So when, when or how soon do you think we can have um, rolling fragments that we can get out of that that can be used we really, as... We really find, uh, found some, some interesting uh, bugs and strange behaviors, but he was explaining the uh, last time, so... Mm. Okay. And so is, given that, is it is it a meaningful activity to... Um, try to generate Rolang fragments from this uh, tracery IO that uh, Greg, I mean, Gary is working with. Well, uh, we need to specify these grammars to, to generate these things. And well, th this is really not easy. You know, this is, <laughs> we, can, we can generate something simple, but uh, if we start, start talking about uh, variable substitution and something more complicated, I'm not sure that this is doable. <laughs> okay. Um, so even random fragments of uh, Roland code is, you think, hard going to be hard to do with uh, tracery? Well, I, I see it as a, as a manual work. So it is. And I'm not sure. Uh, uh, is it faster uh, just write uh, like a normal test or, you know, it, it, is, it is definitely more complicated to write some kind of generator than just write the test. So, and we, we, are, we, we, don't, not, we don't have now the, the test, so uh, I'm not sure how to, how to generate something that, you know, I, I I don't have an idea, you know, what, what, uh, uh, what is the result. No. I'm, I'm thinking just in, in terms of uh, some, some kind of performance test or, or some kind of edge cases and something like that. Yeah. Gotcha. So, and, and, or, and or crash, right? I mean, basically whether unexpected yeah. inputs are going to yeah. uh, crash the code is the other part of it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry guys, I got to uh, I got to drop off. All right, see okay, Dad. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys for indulging me. It, yeah. it was a great conversation. I'm really excited. Yeah, no, that was good. We at least identified the three different levels of uh, what could be done. So yeah. we'll cool. see what what we can do. All right. Thanks so, everybody. Yeah. See you, see you later. Bye. See ya. So. Um, I'm still struggling with this. I guess, give me a, you can stop recording now if you want, Jim. Give me your sense of um, what is here. I mean, is, is, are we barking up the wrong tree? That's what I'm trying to, with the tracery. Oh, this is just a, just a program that, you know, uh, the, my first question is here, how we extract the, 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 the resulting program, you know. How can we generate, uh, you know, ten thousand uh, programs? Uh, is this uh, fast enough? And, you know, what is the interface? What is the API? Who will learn the API? <laughs> you know, this this is all that you know, uh, all the manual work, work, and this is the most difficult part. When you when you do all of these things, you know, after that is it. So. <laughs> right. So, uh, given all that effort, I guess the question is: Are we better off um, with K framework? to do those things. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of, you know, who works with, with, with which program. Right? It came with something that, uh, so, something uh, written in K framework have much more 
uh, aware of it. Right? Because if you learn, if you learn K framework, you will learn something more important than learn some random program, which is probably very, very uh, usually this kind of program that don't think about you know too much in the like more more. Uh, uh, bigger sense you know right right basically you're saying see this, this uh, tracery yes. stuff is rudimentary for what we are trying to do and the k, yeah. k framework may be more I, I i remember dexter uh, this is another program which is very similar and uh, i know guys who, who started with dexter and find the same problems exactly you don't have api you don't have ui and this kind of stuff you know? okay it's it's more like for for a hobby when you when you work when you try you want to try on something right and, but if if you want to to do something uh, more robust uh, you will use like a general purpose language to to do this kind of stuff mm -hmm. not very complicated and how complicated is uh, is it to get something done in K framework to generate I'm thinking that right. maybe we can generate this directly in Roman because if, if oh, in Roman we can just Say okay, take this list and iterate uh, all, all of the elements and create uh, another constructs and execute. I, I see this path maybe more more approachable. Mm -hmm. How uh, um, is that something that anybody wants to take on? In a sense, I, I, I think that everybody wants to, to write something in Roland. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, that's why I'm asking the question. Uh, like, do we do we ask? Uh, the, I, I don't know if anybody is still attending the Roland tutorial classes or Roland stuff. Um, but I'm wondering if we should use those tutorial sessions to generate that kind of stuff in Roland, or would that would they freak out and leave? For for me, I, I would like to have some helper application that uh, enables me to to run uh, programs more easily. Because now it's uh, not very easy. Uh, I mean, I wrote this extension, which uh, is it, much easier, right? But it can be also directly in the browser that you can easily uh, uh, check and see how it's working. Then you know. I'm not sure how, how you approach to, to write new uh, role programs. So, Thomas Lob, so are, are, are you suggesting, um, so we, we, we want to create this in Rolang. So there's, you know, one possibility is creating the, the Rolang code that generates the sentences. The other is to create an application in Rolang, which does uh, all of this so which, which path were you were you uh, thinking about or considering or are those the two paths that you that you do do I have that correct as far as there's two paths to go down I'm, I'm just thinking that uh, we have one problem and if we want to try to solve it uh, uh, taking another application try to learn this uh, other applications maybe maybe it's uh, right more well, th th this, these, this is this is my thoughts, and I'm probably the most basic out of anyone here on the call. Um, I, I think, to, to, you know, the, the goal is to come up with a, an MVC, minimum viable concept or minimum viable prototype. Now, tracery, that's it, and, and and all of this, you know, it's this is all very iterative. You know, we, we can start with something basic and add additional functionality as we as we go along. But I think the very first generation is just to to prove the, the, the general idea so we can communicate what what this is to somebody else. So tracery is a bit advanced with you know all of the words and, and, and everything. Uh, if we were to break it down more into the elements, you know, when you think of a sentence structure in grammar, you have a you have a verb, you have a noun, you have pronouns, you have infinite indefinite articles uh, like a, a, a and an, and you have definite articles like the. So those are just basic elements of of a sentence, 
And if we were to, and those could be the grammars, a noun. So, you know, horse, dog, cat, and so forth. And, you know, a verb, you know, run, jump, uh, uh, walk. So we're, those, those sentence structures, elements, those could be the grammars. And then we can populate, you know, for nouns, we get, you know, a thousand nouns. For verbs, our, it's, it's make it more simple, a hundred nouns. Uh, for verbs, we have a hundred uh, verbs, pronouns, and so forth. And then with the Roland code, it, it, then it starts to generate a sentence. Base, it pulls you know, a, a pronoun, a verb, an infinite, indefinite article, and then a noun. So it creates a sentence. And then, then we just, just run it in a loop, you know, run, run 50. So it pulls from that, that, that database of all of the components of a sentence, and it cr starts creating these sentences, one after the other, uh, and so that would be the first iteration and then we can okay then after that we say okay if you used it a particular noun like horse already don't use it a second time so now we can add in this additional functionality uh, and build on that uh, but I see that as maybe something that's very basic basic and it's it, it's understandable and you can kind of communicate it to somebody else you know if, if I were to view it you, you create this program you want to explain it to somebody what does it do it, it's a sentence generator it, it generates it, we put in all the components of a sentence and it pulls from this database and it and it generates sentences one after the other so I'm thinking that as as, as very elementary and then and this is kind of the um, the software development process. Okay, so we've created this minimum viable concept or product, and then we start talking about these additional functionality that we want to build into it. Now, some features are going to be more complicated than, than others, and we have to really think, you know, what, uh, how, what is the effort, the level of effort involved in adding a specific feature so we want at this point like Ralph said the the low-hanging fruit things that are simple and easy to do uh, but we have to kind of work through you know this backlog of features with the level of effort which ones are going to be the easiest so I think this way this project it doesn't get overwhelming so it, this would be this would reside in the the art chain community uh, GitHub repository so everyone has access to it and everyone can kind of work on it and so we have we have as far as the time uh, hours during the week so we we have you know this hour uh, uh, DAP development there's a few hours during Rolang during the week but Jim has some of those hours dedicated to the liquid democracy Perhaps, you know, he, he might want to give up one or two of those hours. And then on Friday, we, it, Friday can be more like, uh, so Friday in the collab, we have consensus and we have uh, computational calculi at 10 and then uh, at 11. And then we can explore, you know, these additional functionality and what's all involved. Well, first we can kind of explain it, you know, tell everyone in the collab what we're doing. And so that would be opportunity to kind of, you know, promote the project, get others involved. We can kind of see this as a team effort. And then we, and Isaac is usually on those calls on Friday for consensus and for, uh, uh, for the pro process calculi. So he's, he's the K framework guru. So he's going to, he's going to look at this with a different, vantage point of how we can take what we've already created and leverage that it perhaps using K framework or something else into you know uh, it, to the next level but I, I my thought is starting off basic and not uh, you know basic here but so I just wanted to share some of those those thoughts does anyone have any comments Yeah, yeah, I think definitely. Uh, 
it would be it would be nice to start something from something uh, uh, similar or uh, simple and uh, familiar. Okay, so so and and I mean this is simple uh, enough to where I can kind of sketch out an an outline. So you know this is this is the. Uh, grammar dot row this is the grammar project and we kind of create you know the first iteration of what it is that we want to create and it's going to be basic it, people you know it's just and what we create we got to be able to sell it to others say okay this is what we're doing hey how would you like to contribute and then uh, so we'll, we'll take take that and and code it up you know it's like taking a white paper you know uh, it's like, kind of like Dan Conley on Saturday. He's got these, you know, 15-page white papers with all the, uh, gra you know, math symbols uh, that are look like Greek letters to me, and then he puts it into code. This is going to be very basic. So just to take the concepts and put it into uh, generate it, uh, you know, the what what is the the row lang code that we need to generate, you know, a, a sentence and sentences. And then, and then we're off. I think then we're 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 we we have something, and then we can start discussing um, what the, the next uh, uh, iteration will be. And I and, and I I like the idea Rao, of of why don't have this generate rolling code? Uh, you know, if it's generating nouns and verbs, you know, the horse ran. You know, create use that to have a, 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 a for comprehension or something like that, that could be in the backlog of, of the feature set of, of what we wanted to, uh, wanted to do in the future. Uh, so I think that's, that's a, certainly an interesting application of it. Yeah, no, and, no. So what I'm saying is basically generating the rolling code, whether it is correct or not, is more useful from a testing standpoint, uh, is what I'm saying. Okay. Now, now the question is, um, is it just the same amount of effort to generate rolling phrases versus horse ran? Uh, that is kind of what I'm trying to get a sense of, because okay. one one yeah. to me is a lot more useful than the other. It, it, uh, well, it, well, you. you and that's a good point that you don't the fact that you say you don't care if this rolling code makes any sense or not it can just be out there so uh, perhaps that could be you know th that first you know uh minimum viable concept so uh but but then it, then i'll need some help to kind of think through you know in a, in a rolling a line of code you know w what are all the components that w we want to appear so you know, I think that that takes a, a, an additional level of of thought to kind of get there. Uh, but wh why don't we why don't we go uh, do the easy path first? You know, just to kind of get the, the concept down, and then and, and try to um, well. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm. It's open for a commentary as far as what what do, how do people feel as far as what the that first approach is, you know the basics, uh, and I think uh, Ned was kind of in favor of that of you know the you know using a, a sentence with elements of you know uh, grammar in a sentence, but the question is how useful you know will that be something right, that's right. more so, useful. So basically, the, the difference is, is Ned is trying to. Um, get a demoable DAP or uh, yeah, DAP demo is what Ned is trying to get. I'm okay. trying to get test cases or right. something that will exercise the code. That's the difference. <clears throat> okay. So, so, well, uh, and well, I think if, if I mean, if we can generate one, I mean, certainly it seems to me if we can generate the Roland code. Um, like I said, our fragments of rolling code, we can certainly generate the horse ran type of stuff. Okay. Uh, I would imagine. But is, is the horse ran uh, effort, because even there you have to find the grammars and codify the grammar, all that kind of stuff, is that effort uh, the higher priority versus the yeah. rolling grammar and sticking it in there? 
That's so, really the question. Okay. Well, let, let's. I maybe the, the compromise is. Well, I don't know. It's. I I think we we certainly want this to have some utility. So let's let's go down your path first. Uh, as as far as cre creating a uh, um, a sentence structure which is composed of elements of Rolang, and and do we see this as uh, 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 Rolang code that's generated. So, you know, we've got all of our Rolang code in there and it's, it generates 10, 10 lines of code and then it, it runs it. Is that how you kind of envision this work working or? Um, Are you asking about uh, the output or you're asking yeah, about how, output, we, how it's going to be generated? For the, for the output. So let, let's kind of yeah. set our param parameters of we run the crow code and then it's it's so it, it generates it generates some ro our the script generates Rolang code and how many lines of code do we want it to output and then I guess after it generates it then then it runs it and it comes then we get all the errors is that kind of how we see things moving along it, right. it, I mean whatever this thing this activity generates okay uh, what, that dot row file I would run against the code and see how the code behaves Okay, so I think I've got the concept, and uh, we'll we'll just I I it, it's so this we'll call this uh, grammar dot row, and we'll the first effort will be for it to generate Rolang code, and so would that would that Thomas law would that work, or is that too complicated, or what? I guess that's kind of what we're trying to. In Thomas Law, it, the, the code that it generates doesn't have to mean anything, right? It, it's just it's just generating code. Where if that code were to actually run itself, it wouldn't it, it wouldn't necessarily. But, uh, but we we need to know that uh, you know the we need to do we need to know is it correct or not? Because if if we have a, a, an error, we don't know if the error is in the in the code or the error is in the argument. So I, I think there are two levels of errors, right? The first level of error is, is it crashing the code? I think that if, if it is crashing the code, no matter then, what, yeah, no matter then, what. then we have a problem. So yeah. I'm just trying to identify those cases first. Yeah, yeah. Now, as far as accuracy testing, I don't know how much a random generator can really help you with accuracy testing. Um, unless you can also random uh, random generate the validation like Ned was saying before. So which I think may be too complicated. I'm not even using or thinking of this process to help me with accuracy testing. Um, but the random uh, or the crashing or not crashing, uh, because what I don't want is a situation where somebody writes a wrong rolling program and they run it and then the the node crashes that we want yeah. to make sure is not happening that's almost the only goal i'm looking at right now now if somebody yeah. bright or smart yeah. wants to come along and say hey you know i can do better than this because i can actually give you uh working or uh, rolling programs that should work that's a different level i'm not even worried about that at this point in time all right yeah yeah and maybe we can we can uh, uh just specify different uh, role in terms that we can combine uh, uh, exactly what uh, what Steve was suggesting. It, and maybe since this that this concept is so different from the Gary Ned concept of grammar, I think you know, we're we're trying to generate Rolang. So perhaps it, the, the file should be generator dot row because we're generating Rolang. Works or not, it's certainly not going to work. But it's that's what it's all about is to test it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it might, it might. Uh, I mean, somewhere maybe we should also, uh, yeah, generator dot row, and then we can just put a thing in there saying that this is a play program to just generate random row row good. line code. Good. Not, and it, not not allowed or not assumed to work. And so. and if we get stuck, well, it, and and this is how maybe we're going down two paths. We've got over here, we've got the grammar dot row. So, you know, if we're, we're working on gener generator dot row, we got us, you know, a, you know, we're stuck. We can, you know, focus our attention on grammar dot row. Maybe that'll help us figure it out. And then 
we can move up again, move forward on, on gener, generator.ro. So it, it may be having two, two projects kind of go, not necessarily in parallel, but we, we've got a, a backup one in case we get stuck. Uh, we, we always have something that we can be working on. So, and it, it just being able to go back and forth between the two. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I see the vision. I, I see it. And I kind of see what the goal is, and having having the two with the with the generator dot row as the primary, grammar dot row is a sort of a backup, and and I can kind of you know tell this explain tell the story to you know the everyone on the collab on on Friday what it is we're trying to do. So yeah, I I think I've I've got it. So I'm I'm good. Maybe this also can be a place uh, where we can store some of this data that uh, Nadzip are, are, are testing, all of these files and, you know, because we need, we need uh, samples of, uh, of different programs that... You know. Exactly. So, so, so Nadzip are, so maybe we'll, as we kind of work through, you know, I'll, I'll create a document, share it with everyone. And then uh, the next step would be to kind of find a repository of Rolang code. And so uh, perhaps what you have available w could be of that source. So, you know, there's the, the Rolang code to make for the, the Rolang code for generator.row to, to make this thing actually work. Then we need the dummy code to, to, to kind of fill it, to paint, paint the screen. So that's, that's how I'm kind of envisioning this. Yeah, I, I don't think I quite understood that. How does that work? I, I thought, uh, let me think through. So NutZipper is running existing Rolang programs and generator.ro will create new random Rolang programs. I can see that we want to put all those randomly generated Rolang programs in a in a repository or directory and then run them against the uh, code from there. But I didn't, I didn't get the part about how existing programs will feed the generator.ro or... I'm just thinking about, uh, uh, we can store these results. We, we need this information, what, what, that, what is work, what doesn't work. And so we need to store it somewhere. So, right, because we do work all the time. How should what's the what's the metric uh, when we can say it works and it doesn't works? So, for example, I have a bunch of uh, scripts in the downloaded list, which are basically just a uh, burn my CPU code, which is uh, sending recurs in recursion, uh, making a lot of sense. So. If this code is running, so it will just hang, hang make a computer and will eat my CPU time. It doesn't actually test anything. Maybe that my thought for this code to actually work is maybe beyond the scope at, at this point in time. So, we, Thomas Law, the way I interpreted what you were saying as, you know, we, we need examples of Rolang code. You know, where are they going to come from? You know, we could pull them out of how, our minds. Why should you, how should you, 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 you have to have examples of rolling code to build new programs. So you need to build a AI which builds programs or it's, it looks like a kind of non, not a trivial task. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, can, we can really uh, write very, very simple things just to, to, to test the crash or, uh, because generative programs is not something that we, we really know today. <laughs> so okay. we, can, we can really generate some very, very simple things. Yeah, but what, 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 what should we crash? crash? Crash can be stack overflow if we just pull a huge yeah. deploy. You can pull a huge deploy and you can get a stack overflow. You can put a uh, huge recursion and uh, make your CPU got eaten and propose time will be forever. You can do, I don't know what you can do else. Yeah. Most things that I, I believe can go wrong is tied when you're, is tied with consensus part. 
also the Casper when you when you deploying conflicting stuff to different validators and they are trying to get to consensus. If you are just using a single world validator, so things are pretty well managed to date. Yeah. As, as I imagine this. Yeah. So just just hitting a single R node with a with the deploys without understanding what you're doing won't bring you a lot of new bug new bugs in my in my view. So if you just de if you if you are just deploying different stuff to different validators, uh, so this this also uh, you can you can just deploy any, anything. So it, it doesn't matter what code you are deploying because uh, if you are testing if some code deploy is is breaking our node or is breaking the network, this code should break our node, single node. You 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 not necessarily should test it on the network. You should just have one R node. But as I as I said, I believe that this part is already pretty stable. Yeah. I I, I don't just don't understand how how should we and what should we find uh, using this stuff. So um, Nagzipra, are you saying that if we generate let's say twenty random programs out of this activity, and you run um, all those 20 on two or three nodes um, or some combination thereof. Um, then you may be able to discover something new that um, that we would not if we just run it on a single node. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and this is what's happening. Uh, right now i running a, a test on a sandbox. On a sandbox. Uh, my uh, script that is automating the payments. So uh, from the bird's eye, we have two payers, three pays, and every payer is deploying payment to one of the payer pay, for example, every 50, 15 seconds. So every payer can deploy this code to a single validator or to random validators. So right now I executed the test. I uh, passed all these deploys to a single validator. So on the sandbox there are five validators, and I, you know, and all deploys uh, are passed only to node zero. So proposed times do not increase. They are pretty stable. Then when I when I grow DAG uh, through the node zero, I switched in my host's file all the validators that that are supposed to be random all validators all the traffic uh, went to the node 4 and so only node 4 starts growing the dag and the proposed times are stable again but when we're deploying simultaneously to all the nodes and they're trying to get to the consensus to stack blocks that are built by other validators upon their their uh, DAG. So this is where the, the problem starts. So the code can be the same, but when nodes try to get to the consensus over this code deployed to different validators, this is the cause of the problem. This is where the most difficult part. Rao, you're on mute. And and Nadzipra, are you saying that that is not related to the wrong long proposal times, or is long proposal times part of the uh, issue there? Uh, I'm saying that uh, long proposal time. A, I observe that it is related uh, to the um, to the situation where. Uh, nodes have to get to the consensus to the DAG. They because have conflicts, right? Yes, they they not they don't necessarily have conflicts because one DAG can deal with one namespace. For we can call it it's not namespace, but it's it's it do something with a set of names uh, which is not. Uh, intersect with set of names uh, 
in deploys being executed by the other validator. So this is one of the points that should be tested. If we deploy some stuff, for example, we have uh, 100 names sending to each other to one validator, we have set of names not inter intersecting uh, 100 names to the second validator, and we're trying to do some stuff with these names sending to each other and so on, but these two sets should not intersect. So obviously there should be no conflicts yeah. uh, between these two uh, paths of that growth. So uh, uh, as I understand, this may, uh, my uh, gut feeling is this uh, will uh, increase proposed time. So right now I will try to do this on the sandbox. But this is kind of tests that I imagine should be done because uh, all this stuff with con a lot of uh, things can go, um, there can be races, there can be uh, conflicting deploys. So basically this is stuff that we are going to talk about tomorrow on the, on the uh, Casper testing session. But I was thinking that there can be two main reasons for the bad behavior of the network: races and uh, races and conflicting deploys. Uh, races uh, lead to bad behavior because on the uh, outcome of the race resolution, it depends how do you stack ongoing blocks. So if different validators, uh, so this is, this, it depends. If this, uh, if this, is, if, if this uh, particular deploy will resolve uh, sense this way, uh, blocks that will be stacked upon this deploy, upon this block with this deploy, will behave uh, one way. If this block will be, uh, these conflicts will be resolved the other way, the old DAG will go the, the other way. So this is one. And the second is uh, conflicts, when we just deploy conflicting stuff to the validators. And these are two main, two main uh, things that should be heavily tested, at least how I, how I see it now. It just what, what came to my mind. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's but it, easy to write this. Yeah, so so I just try to manually do do some stuff and make a hypothesis uh, and try to figure out what's happening. So basically, it's kind of work that cannot be automated. You just maybe you can, but but it's I think that is an area of uh, investigation <laughs> with a lot of PhDs working on and papers, scientific and theses and conferences so it's not a solved problem we can use it for, for regression tests right if you, if you discover something you can you can say okay now I have a test and uh, we will test it for, for each new version right? and we can say, we can say okay this new version works like like expected so I see these kind of benefits so. you mean, you mean uh, with a automated uh, generated code? I, I mean, uh, you spend some, some time to, 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 to write the test or, or, or the scripts and you can test it for, for each other version, uh, a new version that, uh, that is released and to test the, the same thing and say, okay. Ah, so you mean, ah, in, integration, I, I, I uh, heard re regression. Yeah, regression says that uh, you are testing the, the same test on the new, on the new version and uh, it should in, in, yeah. work. Because yeah, but, but, but he's talking about just a manual test only. I don't think uh, Tom's law is talking about auto Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm testing, I'm, I'm uh, talking about this uh, manual test to just you know, do, do it again on the new version. Because so just if, if you, yeah. if you can, if you figure out the, the pattern where you see bad uh, behavior, for example, you can measure it with uh, increasing proposal time. You can include this into integration test and see 
if this if if it can be done something that will eliminate this prog this problem so from this point of view this can be uh, include into testing right both the both the conflicting um, uh, stuff as well as the non conflicting stuff should be part of the test suite to uh, right i mean the, how you described earlier about the two validators have, are working with different things. All they're doing is just send, send and receive. Um, and that itself is um, having a problem. That's uh, one kind. And the other thing is if the name, namespace is conflict, how is that behaving uh, is the second kind of a test, right? Yeah. Um, so I guess you're saying uh, even on the first one, we are having uh, issues right now. Did you try? Did you try the second one, or you're pretty sure the second one would? Uh, help I just now, out? I just now rebooted uh, the. Uh, or I will drop into Discord uh, the sandbox testing. This is the DAG that I. Uh, grown right now from uh, node zero and then from the node fourth. Right now I restarted the sandbox and will try to do deploys to each validator simultaneously and see what's happened uh, to the proposal uh, time. But I did this today uh, earlier and I as far as I remember, even on the block five, I had a huge proposal time. So I just will try to um, confirm this now. Yes. And also, how did uh, how did your community uh, stuff that you started earlier? How did that go? Did uh, did you conclude all the programs, or is still running them on your uh... I I run the, all the stuff so basically I had all these deploy all these codes deployed to my R node mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, executed proposal and I uh, saw my CPU burned because one of the for example I don't know fifth deploy on the in the sequence was some kind of uh, nested recursion which just maybe was was developed to uh, to <laughs> measure to measure how long will it take so to, to measure performance but it can be that <laughs> there is a one hour test so <laughs> so you never know you should go through all these codes and to figure out what it, what does it do. Right, right. And then basically categorize them so that uh, we can work with it. So are you saying that you basically went through only five or what, did you go beyond five with the... No, I just... Uh, I. Uh, you ran through all of them? No, I... I... Actually, no, I didn't run it. I run it, I run them all in a batch. And uh, on the one of the deploys, on fifth deploy, I, uh, I just uh, control C it. I sh shut down my R node, and that's it. I can run them all in a sequence, deploy, propose, deploy, deploy propose, but I can do that, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that if they are uh, deployed successfully, they should be executed. Or at least I cannot easily figure out that something bad is happening <laughs> because right, right. It, it just won't, won't print anything, anything. Right, so did uh, out of all the programs, did pretty much everything pass? Or I'm wondering what percent of the programs deployed? Uh, I will tell you right now. Uh, about half, so okay. 40, 40, 400 is good, 400 is bad, and about 
from the good ones about uh, about 100 is from our chain official repo mm -hmm. so about 300 files are site projects but there is a cable on the repos uh, and so on so but actually there are some repos which I'm not aware of who are these guys so maybe it will be useful mm -hmm. I will try to uh, I will try to run all these programs and uh, figure out what are they doing but there are 300 of them so I don't know how, how to do this efficient way yeah. yeah I guess I guess that's probably a conversation for another session to think about what can be done with those and what should we do with those right I mean um, but let me let me just kind of back up you know i'm kind of di digesting everything that we've talked about you know uh f for i guess we're going on five o'clock here for the past two hours uh nut zipper has insight as to the testing and the hardening as far as what has uh what we were testing in the past past the obstacles that we've had that we've overcome that are stable now and where what needs to be tested and, and where the the, the hang-ups are so i get the feeling from the conversation from nutzipper that if we go down this path of creating generator dot row or grammar dot row uh with these ideas we've been talking about the the value of that the meaningfulness of that is going to be small compared to other things that he's working on and and i think the the whole objective is whatever we do is put in our efforts we want that to have as much impact as meaning meaningfulness as possible so i i think just to step back and to re analyze our i think we maybe need another approach for the the this effort that we're trying to do where ultimately we want to stress the test the system and test it but uh, i i think uh we, we need a different approach uh and and i nut zipper i think has kind of been getting he's got the uh, the full brunt of the full weight of this effort on his shoulders i get uh, perhaps i you know he's he's the one most mostly doing it involved so um but I think that the my my thought would be, and I'll need to go back and re-watch this video. If we, I, for me, it would be helpful to get an understanding of with these tests that we've been doing, what is now stable, uh, and what what are the areas that are unstable that that need to be work worked on. And I think if if we understand that right now, I think it's only nut zipper has a handle on that he, he's the only one who understands what's stable and where we where, where we need to focus the attention so but it's all in nut zipper's mind and we we have to get it out it into everyone else's in order for everyone else to want to be able to contribute to the effort so uh, so i i just to sum it up, I, I so I, I think we need a, maybe another approach. But NetZipper, did I hear it correctly? You know, this this effort. If we were to go down and create this generator dot row or grammar dot row, that's not going to have as much. The, the value to that will be small. It, 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 did I hear that correctly? If you don't generate it with the uh, with the something in mind uh, understanding how how do you deploy these to different validators so basically are you trying to just uh, benchmark a single node or you are trying to benchmark a network if you're trying to benchmark a network the order of deploys matters so 
it's this is the case where things can go wrong okay and when you say the order of deploys matter is and is that uh the order of deploys so in the sense that say i have five applications all dot row applications and how i have those queued up to to be deployed is is that what you mean by order of the de order of deployment or is it yes. with just within? Okay, so it's multiple applications, yes. not just I one application. My, I guess my, my point is that um, uh, the effort to generate some raw code is is useful to benchmark just a, a single R node, a raw VM, a long virtual machine to okay. to find. Uh, bugs in the interpreter to find bugs in the virtual machine to find where will it take over flow where would it crash and so and so on it's just a benchmark over execution engine of the blockchain but execution engine as far as i know is pretty stable already okay. so you you should benchmark the network how okay. does how does the nodes interconnect with each other and build DAG uh, in connection with each other? Okay. So, so perhaps we should just so with that understanding, the test scenarios that we come up with should be, I think, geared towards that. If we know that the the R node and all those components for a single node they're relatively stable, and any effort that we create. In, in trying to find bugs there is is not going to have as much impact than if we try to create a test scenario in a, in a network a, a testing a network environment so so if, if 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 that's what i'm hearing then perhaps we should focus our energies in in designing uh these test scenarios to test these networks and um so and you and that's what you've been doing. So how can we how can we help? If if it, it and I I I just want to make sure if if is is if if that is kind of the direction that we want to want to go uh, because that's that's a different different from what we've been talking about for the past two hours. So does everyone? What are what is everyone's thoughts on that? Do we, do it, it, uh, to me, it's it's on a different level, right? Because uh, what does it mean to to uh, to unload to crash to to stop working, right? We can have the same situation with uh, with the whole network. It, it can crash. It can stop, right? And this is what uh, what uh, Dadziker is saying. The proposed time is longer and longer. <laughs> it's, if it's, it's too long, <coughs> sorry, uh, the the network is stop working. Right. So, so Thomas Slob, do, do you so, think? And also, and also, so, and also, and also is saying that uh, there is there are some contracts that you know they they will crash in it because they are just you know doing some kind of recursion which will never stop. Because okay. it, it, it doesn't have to pay <laughs> for computation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we're we're going on two hours, but um, I th I think. Uh, Perhaps you, we, we, with our effort, we, we want to maximize any effort in, that, that we put forward testing the network. And I think Nutzipper has that insight. So let's, um, at least we, we have the, a better understanding and appreciation of, of what's stable now and what needs to be tested. Uh, so I. I um, so I'm maybe maybe uh, <clears throat> a better understanding of this uh, test that Nat Zipper is doing uh, <clears throat> will give us uh, uh, like a, a better view of uh, what's going on, right? Well, why why these tests are, are important, right? Because these tests are, are that uh, 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 something that you know you know it's, it's very difficult to understand. They're they're just difficult because all of this configuration that we need to to, to uh, Combine, right? But uh, the, 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 the basic notion of what we want to test is, is, uh, is, is pretty simple, right? We want to send information to, to a bunch of validators and to see 
how the how they will react, how, how they will make consensus, how 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 fast, and what kind of data can uh, can can disable the network, or or because uh, if if they are completely uh, separate, uh, you should not see any any problem with performance. Maybe yeah, a little, but the, the question is what what type of deploys can bring yeah. nodes to be unable to get to the consensus? So this is kind of question that we should ask and try to figure out what what patterns, what data can do this. And one of, one of these questions is exactly Jim's question about how to make, how to make ticketing, right? <clears throat> If you send if you send request to all validators to to get a new ticket, right? Yeah, what was uh, the the yeah the ticket? Uh, and I that's going back but a few like weeks. In, in more general sense, uh, uh, sequencing. The sequence, yes. Uh, the se the sequence. consensus consensus is all about sequencing. It's, it's exactly what okay. Nazi was saying. Different decks uh, combining into one in one place. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, we'll, we'll maybe we'll take a step back, and, and I think I'll, uh, um, maybe I'll reach out to Ned, kind of let him know where the discussion went after you know he dropped off. Um, but I I think it, to get the most value, if we uh, step back, kind of regroup, and and think about this, these tests that we that what what needs to be tested you know we don't want to test necessarily things that are considered stable we want to test things that need to be tested and and start you know focusing our attention uh, around that so uh okay so I'll, I'll touch base with 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 ned uh, on that and then um maybe in the next um uh Few days, sometime during the week, we'll we'll touch base with Nep, Net Zepper to see where his tests are going. But perhaps we can think about, uh, you know, um, uh, how how can we assist Net Zipper? So he's not necessarily, you know, have it, you know, doing everything uh, himself. You know, we certainly want to be able to contribute as much as we can. And, but what does that mean? What 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 are we in the position to do? You know, some things that only Nutzipper can do, but you know, uh, but hopefully there's things that we can do as a community as well. But it just Actually, that, I, I can, go ahead. I can uh, uh, drop a request. The UI is not touched by anything. So basically, there are a lot of stuff. Uh, front end work, uh, drawing, planning UI, not necessarily just uh, just uh, coding UI. Research uh, what type of uh, utilities are used in other projects. For example, faucets uh, for the test nets on the Ethereum, uh, MetaMask, other stuff that are used in other. Uh, blockchain ecosystems, which are uh, make uh, the life of developers easier. So these all stuff, which may be uh, pulled to to the R chain. There are a lot of stuff that we just don't talk about. For example, uh, as the testnet three is to come, we won't be able to mint any tokens anymore so we have to ask dev team give me tokens but it doesn't actually very good because dev team have a lot of stuff to do right and and we as a community can build a ui and just ask uh for uh dev team to mint uh, some revs into the one wallet which was be which should be provided uh, should be used in this faucet, and uh, in automated way uh, we can just uh, send tokens from this faucet. So this this is one kind of stuff that is can can be easily done by by the community. Okay, so let me propose this. So uh, Tomislav, you've created a a user interface 
uh, that we were working with the other day with, with the texting and so forth. So it, on that idea of, of NetZippers, what if, if, if we were to be able to create an account, you know, Jim has an account, Steve has an account, Gary has an account, and we, we figure out, we research how to get, you know, this faucet uh, working to where, it, you know, we have a, have a faucet and then we can have the dev team allocate tokens to this faucet and that can be divvied up among account members on your user interface. And then perhaps that would, would NutZipper, would that help achieve that, that goal of the, the, uh, developing a, a UI with, uh, with tokens uh, as, as assigned to accounts? You can just go to the this stuff and just see how it should work. We, we just need some kind of way of uh, uh, restricting uh, uh, these kind of operations to to only some of the people, right? You don't want to 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 open it up to everyone because we want to have a control. Right? We, we don't want to to someone to just. You know, click on something and uh, spend all of the money. Well, so you, we start doing it. Right. You you can uh, in, traditionally just you log in with your GitHub account and you get some yeah. small amount of of tokens. Yeah, yeah, Th that was my oh, idea. Okay, yeah. okay. Some and uh, we can say these people can change it, uh, whatever they want. And yeah. Yeah. talking about the faucet, uh, uh, maybe Dean Worm is working on this stuff. So I I don't don't know. Uh, at least if someone want to start working on this, better okay. ask Dean Worm first. So we'll, we'll work, if everyone is in agreement, we'll work on the faucet idea, leveraging what Thomas Lav has created with his website. But in the meantime, we'll start to think about uh, the, the, the bigger picture, which is stress testing the, the multi- the R nodes, uh, uh, sets of uh, sets of R nodes, and how uh, the the uh, the configuration of the uh, applications, how that impacts what what test what test we can come up with uh, to to test the network, like what you're doing now. So we we need to you're you're at a an advanced space place. We're further behind, but we want to catch up closer to where you are, and we, we have to figure out how to do that without taking away from your effort that you're doing. But at least for me, I understand where the trouble spots are, what's safe, what's stable, and where we need to focus our direction, and we just have to figure out how, what tests we need to do to kind of to get there and how to get there. So how do, am I, how does everyone feel uh, about that? So we'll work on the faucet kind of with what Thomas Lav is, or um, with uh, Nutsipper is talking about, and then figure out how to maximize uh, the tests and what they, they'll be. I, I'm wondering, so this comment about UI design, is that to help the testing or is that for, is that a different topic? Well, this uh, the, this makes people uh, actually uh, using stuff, <laughs> and okay. this will this will help because uh, people will use application and it will create traffic in the network. We can, we can for example, have a, a button to restart the network, right? If we can uh, automate this, we can we can have a button to restart. But who will see the button, right? <laughs> We don't want to anyone to, to just press the button and restart the net. We want to, yeah. to have some kind of uh, for, for example, the Joshi's uh, status app. Uh, maybe while we are working on the back end, uh, maybe there is a way to work on the front end and the R sign application, which is a, a plugin. For the Chrome browser, maybe there's a way to to uh, do some UI work. What should be there? How should this work? Uh, what are the user path experience? And to writing this in the document, so 
after coder will come and uh, don't have to think all about this stuff. Yeah, and I have the same the same problem uh, because I don't have too much experience for all the wallets that already exist. And, yeah, you know. so this is this is a problem. There are a lot of stuff that already done, and there are a lot of work that uh, been put into this. There are a lot of wallets by other blockchains, and they spend a lot of money <laughs> to design them, and uh, it takes a lot of time to get best practices out of that. Yeah. Okay, so. I, I I like I like the direction that we're headed. I mean, I I, I feel like it's it, it's it's going to we're going to get a, a more reward for our efforts. So uh, let's take a let, let's I think let's let's kind of it, it take a break. Um, I'll type put something together to kind of summarize my understanding of where we're at. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it in our DAP developer folder. I'll share the link with everyone. And it'll, it'll kind of have uh, uh, our, our status and our action items. And then we'll build on that. So I think this is uh, setting a, a sense of where our direction. And then we'll, we'll focus on what uh, we need to figure out what, what are the next steps. So how does... Uh, how does that sound for for the next steps? So um, uh, I'll I'll put together a sort of a summary, and then we'll 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 discuss that in in Discord. So um, everyone, does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, Nutsipper, I want to give a special thank you to you for because I know it's late where you are at, and you you stayed on for an additional hour. So. Uh, I, I want to, yeah, a special thank you for staying on and for your efforts in what you're doing on the, the testing for the, the hardening. So Yeah, I second that. The, thank you very much. We, we, have, a, we have a term here in the United States. Uh, we're calling in the Calvary, which is the, all the backups and reserves are coming in to, to help out. We're, we're on our way. We're not there, but, you know, we've called the Calvary and we're, we're headed uh, – to, to help, so we're, we'll be there. Uh, we'll, we'll be catching up with where you're at, hopefully in the near future. So, um, thanks again, everyone. Jim, hey guys, thanks. Go ahead. Last yeah, thing. go ahead, please. I upload into the sandbox testnet. Uh, the DAG I deployed to different validators, and it turned out to be good actually because proposed time didn't increase. So. So that's the problem because <laughs> I, I'm not sure that it was this kind before. And uh, I will I will try different test scenarios, but I, as you can see, the DAG is pretty, pretty. <laughs> so it it, I'm sorry, it, 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 I, I'm looking at the graph now. So explain one more time what, what I'm looking at and what, what's the issue that you're having. Can, can you share the screen, somebody? Yeah, here, I'm sorry. There we go. Yeah, so uh, do you want me to talk about the first graph one oh, more time? I guess, yes, if you need to explain the first graph to help us better understand the second graph, so, so go ahead. Here, all deploys goes to the to a single validator. So all all the payers deploy their payment transactions to a single validator, and uh, I switch uh, a validator uh, uh, to which they are deploying in this line where you can see that graph starts to build uh, on another node. Okay. So proposal times was stable. And now I switched uh, the deploy uh, scheme into uh, into uh, each uh, pay deploy to every validator some transaction. So all nodes start building their deck simultaneously 
uh, and actually these transactions should be conflicting because as you can see maybe i should let me share my screen okay hear me so yeah. so so you can see my go ahead mouse so uh so you can see actually each block is a uh, one from one to six deploys uh here uh a pay pay one send some transaction in this block the same pay payer send some transaction this this and this so actually all these blocks should in, include uh, a transaction from uh, a single wallet so basically they they are should be considered as conflicting but it looks like these conflicts somehow are result and maybe this one are in line. So uh, most probably these uh, these proposals were ex ex executed in uh, about simultaneously. So looks like uh, node this node is always a bit uh, ahead of others. And when our others deploy their conflicting transactions, they build upon the this this version. So the, my point that when I switch to de, to deploy to to everybody to all validators, uh, proposal times are still good. Mm -hmm. I will try to to do something something else and report in the test nets inbox. Is it possible that this second validator has uh, the more the most weight and wins all all of the contents? Actually, I don't think so because because we should have we should have let me check uh, so they all have uh, the same bonds amount. Oh, looks like so, 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 so. No, no, no. Looks like, looks like there are, uh, they are like this. So, validator five have 1010 bond. So, th this is the topic that I'm not fully aware of. How does bonds amount depend on the uh, Casper decisions? So it's one more moving part and part which I don't know. Is, is this just a sample? I mean, is this something that they set up so that the bond amounts are different? They're basically saying validator, let's say two power four is 64. No, 16, two power five is 64. So validator five in this case would have 1,065. Yeah. And uh, right, I mean that's basically uh, who you would. I'm I'm wondering if this is just a sample uh, setup. Yeah, yeah, this is just a, just a sample setup, and uh, and I'm not sure should this be like that. What will be if all validators will will have the same bond amount? Maybe in this case they won't get to the cons consensus uh, it may cause some problems what happened if uh, a single validator will get almost 50 percent or, or 30 percent or so these are uh, cases which are needed to, to be related yeah. yeah i mean that's a that's a different question i have uh, somewhat related to this is in the casper protocol I'm not sure how much, I, I know that in terms of choosing the next validator, we use some random generator function to choose, to choose the next one. But what I'm not sure is whether overall the protocol is, uh, is in a state or, in, in, or its mechanism is such that it expands uh, 
decentralization as opposed to concentrates decentralization, right? For example, when you use something like Tor, um, each time you want to access something, they say, okay, give us one or more channels to be able to do that. So the decentralization sort of expands. But I'm not sure what the mechanism is for that in the Casper protocol, unless actually we give more weight to the randomness than we do to the stake, right? Yeah, and actually that's the question that I wrote in the sheet uh, in the document that is that is kind of a nice things that dev developers might want to know from the core dev team because uh, if uh, I'm not fully aware of Casper and what's the uh, what, what what's the random uh, election of the next validator I'm not sure I understand what what this is because can I deploy to every validator or or not or if I deploy to a single validator when I deploy actually I, I don't think that my deploy will be passed to maybe it just re rewards will be uh, um, will be passed according to this rule. So in, in, the, in the graph that you were showing, you did deploy to not two validators, but all five? Yes, yes. Okay, so in that it's case, I'm actually, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit uh, happy that, <laughs> that the validator five, who would have the most stake, has not gotten the, um, he's not the dominating one. Right, I mean, it seems like it's more of a who got it first and then maybe it's going from there. I'm not sure. But we, we don't know what is the fifth validator, right? We can, we can try to figure out. Actually, this one, 0472, 0472, we can check the the bones file URI. Oh no, this is not it. Mm. Don't record this. Oh, actually, this public key, so it's okay. Um, wallets bones file. Mm. Actually, it looks like. There is no way to to figure out. Yeah, this is the. There's no to figure out. No way to figure out private keys on the validators. The sandbox. So no, we can't. But but I have a gut feeling that this is the fifth. Oh, you think that's the fifth? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's just just uh, because he has more stake, he became the first one who take the lead. And and and, and, it, and this is concerning if this is if it continues like that because um, this is the point I was making about decentralization or max uh, increasing decentralization versus concentrating. Yeah, um, but, but, but every other validators are uh, creating blocks also as, as as this one, but as this one has a slightly big stake uh, in the situation where everyone trying to propose blocks simultaneously, he's the first one uh, on top of uh, which other will build their stuff. You just have to elect someone who will be the first? Because you're you're sending uh, the same deploy to all of them. Uh, not not the same, but uh, yeah, not to not totally the same, but uh, from the same the, channels involved. Yes, the same channels involved. So I guess what we need to see or test, one of the things we need to test is to see if uh, somebody has more of the stake, whether they always dominate or not, right? Because if that is the case, there's a bit of a problem with the... But this doesn't mean that uh, this 
this one don't work, right? You can you can send to other validator and he will get the block, right? This is like a forcefully sending <laughs> to all of the validators, right? If you if you send the first one, only the first one will create the block and all the others will just follow. Because the the other validators doesn't have this information, so they will just approve it. Yeah, but there there can be a case where, uh, for example, the fifth validator proposes a block, then other validators try to propose a block and include it in into the DAG uh, their blocks, but validator five proposes again, and this new block is conflicting with the block of other validators, and he dropped them again and just build his own chain and always dropping uh, other blocks because they're conflicting with what he is doing. Mm -hmm. So this, this may be the case. And it's worth uh, trying and at least building, trying to build a DAG to see how, how will it look like uh, if one validator will have more than 50% stake. Mm -hmm. If you have more than 50% stake, I think Mike Stay was saying in one of the channels the other day that uh, that you would overpower more than 51% or something, or 51% or more, I think, as he was saying, would overpower. Yeah, if you, yeah. If you have one third, you, you also can stop the network. One, one third also, yes, has a problem. Uh, so I don't know how we would fix that. I mean, do we... Uh, do we then say that uh, give more weight to randomness rather than to the state? I mean, is that how you would uh, alleviate that problem somehow? More weight to randomness, I'm not sure I'm following. What does in, this mean? In terms of the choosing, because there is a degree of choice that you still do, um, I think there is still a... Uh, ah, and so in, in uh, selection the validator. Right. But that's the question. Uh, there is no documentation on how actually Casper works and how, if, as far as I understand, uh, this is pure um, proof of stake. So there is no election and no leader, uh, but there are some concept of rounds. Uh, and uh, in each round, there is some kind of random validator election or or selection and what is this for uh, it's not clear for developer and for tester uh, and uh, what the consequences should came out from this because as i understand if if a single validator has 50 percent stake the mechanism uh, how will it uh, makes the network uh, keys of operating. I don't fully understand this because other validators can can deploy stuff and propose a block. And what's the what's the what's the the mechanism of uh, ruling validator with the high stake to just drop this block exactly he he may propose a block which is conflicting maybe and include this in blocks but can he, he cannot just drop the block and slash that validators or or he, or or he can just slash all the validators out of the network but uh, he can he can just stop uh, creating blocks if you have one third you can just stop creating blocks and you will stop the whole yeah, but other val other validators will actually create blocks. They they cannot they can create, but they cannot make consensus because they need uh, two thirds of mm. validators that uh, that confirm. So there is like some kind of sweet spot with uh, one third and two thirds. So so how will it look on the VDAG? I wonder. Hmm. So they, yeah. they can't come to consensus, so they keep proposing, proposing, proposing. And no, one's, no one knows uh, on top of which block to build a new block. Yeah. So they all, they all build a block on top of the last one, which is known to be 
like finalized. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they okay. can have they, they they cannot produce new final edit blocks because mm -hmm. they, they so maybe have, it will looks like all this like a tree yeah. with no new blocks uh, rooted with the one single block. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. There's a lot of stuff to think about and to talk. <laughs> this was. Yeah, I mean, we definitely want to know how how Casper is working. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And maybe maybe uh, maybe they are developing some parts. So so it's not fair to to say this is not working. But we don't know. Right? So. Yes. Yeah. This is the case. So if we want to test uh, network, we want we should should to know how this network operates, and this is not really clear we we should have just try try and check what's happening okay very good thank you so um i i want to cycle back to your comment uh, clearly the net network piece of it and the casper piece of it needs to be tested and i think you're uh, not zipper you're saying that that's the higher priority right now but in terms of saying the single node is relatively stable is that because you're saying, okay, well, we ran these 300 new programs at it um, and it still kind of survived um, and worked well. So that's the reason, is that the reason for your no. conclusion that the node is relatively no. stable? No, just Greg, Greg said in like uh, fall of the 2011 that our node was pretty stable and tested and and as far as I know, it was no like huge, huge bugs and, and, and obvious bugs that can be just uh, revealed by a non pro coder in Rolang. I know that uh, Isaac, uh, I heard that he submitted some bug with the it's a different with the Roland, but he's a pro, and I don't understand what <laughs> what the code he submitted does. And I definitely won't write this code, and uh, I don't think that automated script will write this code. So to reveal such kind of a bug, that's a good analogy. Yeah, I I sat in on the session where Isaac went in depth as far as the K, K, K framework, what that bug was, it's a matching bug. And he explained what, what he thought it should be. So when you, when you put it in that perspective, as far as what Isaac created and what, what generate, what he thinks is a bug and it's still questionable. He thinks that there's still a possibility. It may be just the way it works. So would, would something that we create, uh, with uh, generator.row be able to replicate finding that type of bug? You know, that, uh, it's a question mark, but um, uh, so go ahead. I, uh, but I, I just, think, uh, it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, but, but I, th I think uh, we, we would put a lot of time and effort in, into uh, creating something, a test, case in order to ultimately we 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 may find you know some bugs or we may not and it it, it it wouldn't be conclusive but i think in order to what you're doing here with with the deploys uh, across the five nodes and really uh questioning how consensus is working well we can we could get a lot of uh reward for the effort that we i think if we put in if we understand it better under, under i ha, i'm having a better understanding of what it is that you're focusing on and and i think with our with our efforts there we we would be more uh we would find not not necessarily what we could find bugs but we could really uh uh, certainly get a better understanding of how consensus is working and, 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 and understand, see, you know, question if it's working correctly. So is, you know, where do we want to focus our efforts? Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, I, yep. I thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Have a good night. Thanks again.
Yeah. But thank you, Nazim. Yeah. Thank Have you. Bye. Bye. I think I'll go. <laughs> yep.